All right. So here you see that uh, I wanted to show you the guide for authors. So every journal that you want to publish in, um, they will give you a guideline for how to publish your paper and how to format your paper. So I briefly touched on this topic in our academic writing workshop also, where I talked briefly about where to find the requirements for every journal. So this is the journal that I have submitted my latest paper in. It's Journal of Research in Personality. It has quite a um, high impact factor and it publishes um, original research in personality psychology. Uh, so it has different types uh, of papers that you can submit in. So I, I'm gonna go briefly one by one uh, on the aims and scopes of the journal as well as uh, the requirements of the paper. So first of all, uh, to begin with, you can also download this guide in PDF. So that means that if you want to study that on your own computer in your free time, you can do that. And all of this will be available in a PDF format so you can download that. Now let's go to the first thing, which is checking the status of your paper. So assume that you have already submitted your manuscript. So how to see what stage your manuscript is in? Is it already assigned to a peer reviewer? Or is it uh, already back from a peer reviewer with your with his comments? Uh, so for this specific journal, you can go into the system of Elsevier that actually tells you the status of your paper. Uh, and you can go to Avis, which is the Elsevier system. So, I don't know why that's not working. Okay, so there's another way also I'm going to show you. Uh, you can also check the status of your paper in the on the link where you actually submit that. So I submitted the paper on the link. For example, on the left side, you can click submit your paper. Do you see the other tab also, the new tab? Okay. I didn't get your response. I think I was just connected or something. Anyways, so this new page, um, you first have to sign up. If you have not already done that, you can register and you will have username and password. And then depending on your role, you will click on author login. So you're going to enter your details in there. And then actually I can go ahead and show you that. So I enter my username and password and I do the author login. And now it will have an interface where you can submit your paper. So you see on the top, you can see submit new manuscript and here you can enter the manuscript and it's going to give you different steps um, in which you have to submit your paper. And I'm going to discuss those steps one by one so that you would know. But anyways, this is another way to see the status of your uh, manuscript if you have done that. If your AV system is not working, which is this AV um, system, if it's not working, you can simply go to your um, author view of the journal that you want to submit in, and then you can see the status here. So, so you see, um, after you have submitted the new manuscript, you have the submission sent back to author. So if there are any comments um, or notes or changes that the editor wants you to make, uh, is going to assign it back to you and you can make the changes. You can also see the incomplete submissions if there are any documents um, or changes that you had to put that in, put, the in, put it in the paper, but you didn't. So it's going to let you know that you have one submissions that you have to correct. And then you also have submissions waiting for author's approval and submissions being processed and then revisions and you're, there are different, different stages. So there's one decision um, that I'm awaiting uh, for this paper. So um, back to the status. So the other thing is that um, you have to differentiate between the requirements for new and revised submissions. So one is that um, you submit your paper in a format and a Word or PDF uh, format that um, you can use to send for the referring process. So this is the initial stage where you do the submissions and it can be in any format um, because it's not the final one. You know, before your final acceptance, you have to um, send the correctly formatted um, paper that is acceptable in that specific journal. But if it's not, then you would need um, some corrections to make. But at this stage, you don't have to do that. 
Now, this is a brief um, overview of the journal that um, you might want to read before you submit your manuscript. And this is one of the reasons that people get rejected because sometimes they do not read the journal description and how their paper matches with the journal and its vision and scope. So if your paper, for example, is about cross-cultural psychology and you're publishing it in Journal of Research and Personality, you're more likely to get rejection because of that. Um, because um, the journal does not publish papers um, that you're trying to publish that in. So a better journal would be a journal for cross-culture psychology and other relevant journals. So you might want to read that introduction before you actually go ahead and submit that. Now, there's a lot of questions that I get uh, from students about the kind of papers that you have to publish um, in a journal. Um, there could be a lot of different types of papers. Some people think that it's only the full length articles um, that you can publish. Um, it's not correct. There are so many other things that you can do that. Uh, for example, you can, um, the most standard is full length articles where you're actually doing single studies or multiple studies on a specific topic that is within the personality psychology domain. But there are other things um, like brief reports. So these are the basic empirical study reports. So if you have studied a certain um, case or in a certain context or organization and you have a brief report about the outcomes of your study, uh, you can publish that in journal as well, as long as it contributes um, in the scientific domain and it's unique. Now, it could also be short communications that give us um, a succinct and overarching view of um, the topic. Okay, and then we also have register report. Now, this is interesting um, in psychology because uh, nowadays it's becoming more common that we register, pre-register our studies before we actually conduct those. So the scientific community actually knows that you plan to conduct this study and um, you have to list your uh, methods that you would use in that particular study um, and what are, what are the outcomes that you're expecting out of that study and how is that going to be contributing to the existing literature. So the results of those registered uh, or pre-registered studies uh, can also be published in this manual. Um, then you can also use replication studies. In replication studies, what um, happens is that if there's already a study made in one part of the world and you want to replicate that study in um, your country um, or in a specific organization, you can uh, simply run the same study or copy the same experiment um, in your own context and see what the results are. If you were able to replicate the study successfully, you can report that and that would uh, be categorized as replication study and it will be published um, as replication study. Um, now there is an interesting topic and it's a very complicated and deep one when it comes to publishing in journals these days. Uh, it's both unfortunate and unfortunate that the sample size and power issue um, of the results um, are um, key feature of any publication these days. So that means that you will have to have enough sample size and power to show that this is a significant contribution. Now, um, this is unfortunate also that a um, lot of studies that show that previously furnished results are not replicable and there is contrary evidence to establish um, theories which do not get published because journals and editors are biased in uh, positive outcomes or positive um, large effect sizes and um, power based studies, uh, which is sad because a lot of these studies are actually very robust and negative studies should be given the same coverage as the positive studies. But in general, um, you do have to follow a certain standard of sample size and power and make sure that um, your studies um, do show a significant uh, difference uh, from the phenomena um, being studied. So that means that if you're studying that um, 
a certain drug is better than all other drugs in the market for a particular disease and it has to have enough power to show that you know it is not by mere chance now um, this is something that i encourage my students um, and other researchers to do that whenever you're collecting data uh, or you're writing code for example r code for data analysis uh, and you have other open materials and do upload that on um, osf or the open science frame work website so that everyone else can see that and help you with your um, analysis or give you um, feedback on your work. This is how the scientific community actually help each other in making sure that the science that we're following um, is not biased and it's uh, following the robust standards um, of inquiry. It is, uh, utmost, it is of utmost importance that we keep our data open for everyone else um, to not only replicate, but also uh, verify that um, the data we are reporting um, is intact and complete. So um, for this specific journal, they want to make sure that um, the data that you're reporting is available openly for everyone. So a best way to do that is to upload that on Open Science Framework, where everyone can do that. Um, also, if there are any additional disclosure uh, about your codes, your materials, authors, uh, manuscript writing, or whoever contributed in, in the research paper, you have to make disclosures also. I'm going to be showing you what disclosures are made and how to um, submit those parts separately, because journals ask you to um, submit different portions of your paper separately. For example, acknowledgement has to be in another file. Um, the funding source has to be in another, in another file. Uh, the manuscript without other information for peer review should be in another file. So these are the things that you might want to keep in mind before you actually submit your information because you have to go through the system and it's going to ask you to do that. So you have to be mentally prepared that all these files are ready. So um, there is a certain format for contact details and only one author can be a corresponding author um, that would con be in contact with the editors and will take care of all the um, reviewers, comments and um, revisions. Um, now this is the important part where you actually go through the submission checklist. Before you submit all the uh, manuscript and the data files and the code, uh, make sure your paper includes all of these things. First, your email address for the correspondence and your full postal address uh, if you were to um, send the print form of um, your paper, it has to be there. Uh, in your manuscript, it should include keywords, all the figures, um, tables, um, and the figure and table citations um, match in the file that you have provided. You can also indicate that if you want and colorful figures in the print or you want to keep it black and white because many journals charge you separate for the colored version of um, your tables and figures um, and that varies from different journals to journals but you have to indicate that in your submission. You can also add supplemental files or graphical abstracts um, or highlight files if um, that is part of your paper. Now, uh, further considerations are that manuscript has been spell checked and grammar checked. This is why I keep focusing on the fact that you should use tools like and Grammarly and Reference Write so that your paper does not get rejected, at least on the basis of um, academic language and grammatic um, correctness. So that is something that you do not want to risk uh, after having put so much time in writing a paper. Also, uh, make sure that the references that you have uh, put in your paper, they are properly cited in, within the text and also in the bibliography. Uh, please do not leave it uh, to manual copy pasting because that can become a huge problem, especially when you have to match it with the in-text citation and bibliography. Um, this is a common practice, unfortunately, in our part of the world and People tend to do that a lot, but please use some kind of software like um, EndNote or Mendeley or even Latex. So if these are the things that um, you are not using, um, please do consider using these things.
Um, also, you have to include an interest statement and that you have to show that there is no competing interest or um, there is no one who's benefiting from your research. So your research is unbiased and there is no one funding you. If there is funding available for your project, uh, for example, higher education commission or some organization or a research institute, you have to write that as part of your funding resource to um, make sure that your declaration is in front of everyone. Now, uh, once you have gone through all these um, checklists and steps, uh, make sure that you are reporting and you have the right permissions to conduct the studies that you're doing, uh, especially in studies involving humans and animals. You have to make sure that uh, if it's your university or if it's a research institute, you have uh, to follow the code of ethics. Um, of that particular institute. Um, you have taken proper informed consent, you have um, briefed your participants about the nature of study and how it's going to be reported. It's also an uh, ethical question that after your research, please do uh, inform them of the results of the study and send them a copy uh, if you can and thank them for that. Um, and you can also help them understand what it might mean uh, for their uh, personal growth or our understanding of science uh, and generally people are very happy when you do that so please do that and make sure that you follow all the animal and human experiment guidelines that are available there now uh, if there is a specific interest uh, be it financial or personal relationship involved in your paper uh, that might bias the outcome of your studies you have to report that in the beginning and uh, so this is part of the common courtesy in scientific community that if there is something that's directly benefiting you, then you might not want to do that or at least declare that so that people know that uh, there might be a bias there. And um, the experiment itself is transparent enough so that if there is a bias, so everyone can else can actually point this out. Um, so it's a very good thing that you do that in your manuscript and uh, as part of submission you have to make a separate file and attach it in a separate section that says declarations of declaration of interest we already showed you this other um, window where you can submit your manuscript and in that part you will have to add this declaration of interest in the respective section um, so that it will be reviewed by the editors separately uh, now, use of inclusive language, make sure your language is not biased. For example, you're not excluding a certain race or age um, or sex um, or different uh, minority groups or uh, different groups that are at high risk of uh, being excluded from your research and your language is not biased. Um, science um, is supposed to find objective resolutions of issues that we have around us. Um, we do not uh, intentionally or unintentionally want to exclude or ex include people that does not serve any purpose or that might bias our research. Um, so that's something that you might want to um, take care about when you are writing your paper. Now, if there are any changes to your authorship, for example, if you're a couple of uh, researchers working on a paper and eventually someone decides not to write about um, the issue and does not want to be a part of paper anymore. So you can also send an email to the editor um, before the manuscript has been f uh, finalized. Um, because generally once it's been published, it's uh, really um, hard and it's a long process to get someone edit or remove. So that's something you might want to care about also. Now the uh, copyright portion and uh, that varies from uh, different journal to journal. Uh, you will have a journal publishing agreement uh, with Elsevier at least for this um, paper but in general you will have um, different options. There's an option for open access also but that costs uh, in most journals um, a small price that you would have to pay or your institution has to pay so that everyone can freely access um, your papers. So that's something you might want to look into and make sure uh, before publications that um, you have decided on how you would like to proceed with your uh, papers. Um, it also includes the use of free prints, uh, like my preprint is on ResearchGate. Uh, and many scientists around the world can read that paper uh, without actually having to um, 
buy a journal subscription for that. Um, preprint actually means that um, your paper has been accepted in a journal and um, before print, people can actually read there also. Uh, in some cases, and I have found that recently also myself, that um, preprint generally is referred to papers that have been accepted and uh, are waiting publishing and not the papers uh, that have not been peer reviewed. Um, I have been uploading papers before that have not been accepted, but in my case, it's very different um, because I generally do not um, care much for the publication. Uh, I generally do not like to publish in journals because it's a lot lengthy process and um, generally um, sometimes it's not your own fault at all. Sometimes there are a lot of good papers that do get rejected because of the cues um, that are outstanding for previous papers and uh, yeah, that's why a lot of good science actually falls in between the cracks because of the journal policies. And, it, and we all know this, um, it's a very complex monopoly also. There's lots of discrimination involved and there's lots of um, pulling the strings uh, when it comes to publishing. So I tend to publish uh, more in conferences and the kind of research that I also do is the applied research that actually can be applied to real life situations that would ameliorate the situation of education and our understanding of um, the social issues around us. Um, so I do more practical work than the academic work. I also am not a nine to five academic. That means, you know, I teach out of passion. And I like to teach um, children and I do that. And this is why it's particularly not very important for me to publish in um, journals. But if you do, uh, just make sure that your paper has been accepted in a journal um, before you actually send it out as preprints. So that was for the preprints and now the author rights. Uh, you might also want to check with your university if they want to assume the authorship or have the copyrights for your work. Yeah, especially applies if you're being funded by institution. Um, so that's something you might want to check also. Um, you can also uh, make sure that you share your paper, but in a um, responsible way. Um, and the guidelines for that um, are available on that link. I'm not going to go into that. Now, again, we've already talked about open access and the funding source. Um, and if you need any help, uh, about your language, about the editing, about um, the environment. So Elsevier has different resources for that. So you can go to the Research Academy. Uh, it's a free e-learning platform that's going to help you um, go through your research um, journey. And uh, they have different uh, tools that you could use. Um, and it has interactive videos and, and courses that's going to help you with that. Um, and there, there are a lot of tools. And one more thing, um, I just saw that, so I, I'm reminded of that. So ORCID is something that every researcher should make. So this is the researcher ID um, that will be attached to your research paper when it gets published. And any paper that would ever be published with your name, um, if that's with your ORC, ORCID, it's automatically going to connected with your ID. So it's easy for researchers to search not only your papers, but also your research work to be um, associated with you. So are there any questions so far? So you can ask any questions if you want to ask. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. All right, so you have the, have the mic also. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Specifically in your case, because um, I understand that, you know, you want to get your publications done as soon as possible. Yes. Um, I, was, I was going to ask, like you said that, okay, I am, I'm also of the same opinion. I'm also like more or less on the same thing. But I also like conferences that uh, they publish very early and very soon. But the thing is that in the academic career, publications matlab, coming out of from conferences, they don't count. Conference papers, they don't count. Um, the thing is that if you're published in a journal, so are there any journals which publish like good, good journals is they publish like in six, within six months time? Um, actually, I think most journals uh, give you a decision within six to 10 weeks. Uh, it doesn't even matter if it's good or not. I mean, um, I think there are longer periods for um, top 
to your journals. But in general, six to 10 weeks is uh, when you at least get your first decision. And then afterwards, um, your paper does get published within a couple of months, I think. So, so that's not um, too long. For some journals, it can be um, like three to four months. Um, but other than that, it's uh, fine. And I also do understand, you know, as academics, um, people who are in regular jobs, 95 jobs, it's really important for them to actually publish um, in different journals. But um, it's not like either um, or case here. Um, so there are different good journals that you can actually publish in that are quite fast um, and they do publish good results also. Um, so you can publish there also. Um, the good part of um, publishing is that there are so many good journals now um, which are outside uh, Pakistan also. So that means you have the whole world as a battlefield to play in. So you can find good journals everywhere and publish that. Um, and as long as your um, science is um, good, replicable, um, with solid data and robust methods, I don't think that um, that's an issue for um, any journal to publish your research. And um, you will also get um, published in journal that w was a requirement for your university. So I guess there's a good middle path here. I have another question. I want to convert my PhD thesis into a book. Uh, sure. How can I do that? Um, there are different publishers out there who actually do that. Um, I think if you go online and um, do um, a search on publishing your PhD thesis as a book, um, there are a lot of journals, I'm sorry, there are a lot of publishers who actually do that. Uh, I don't have any name on top of my head at the moment, but I think that it's fairly easy to uh, find these um, and it shouldn't be too hard. It's a very good thing also actually because uh, in general when we write papers also, we tend to cite only journal papers and, and conferences and um, books, but we certainly do not look into um, the thesis and dissertations, which is why a lot of good work um, has been left out. Um, so it's probably a very good idea to get it published as a book so that you know it's out there. I think uh, the reason that a lot of good work is being left out is because of the pressures that keep coming along like with your academic career you have to work hard you have to focus you have to get certain number of publications in order to sustain your career your appraisals and all those I think those are the pressures that people you know try to survive so they keep overlooking or they overlook or I don't know they like bypass or they don't have the time to go and look into the good quality work but I really need your help in publishing my thesis as a book. Um, unfortunately I do not have a publishing house or I would have been more helpful but you know certainly... like no that I didn't mean that but like you publishing house or something just guide me like how to convert it into a book and then you know which uh, publisher to approach like I'll find the websites or something sure um uh, there are I think I did know a couple of them before but I haven't seen um, them in a while. So I'm going to ask if I can actually find that else for you, the links. Um, and that's where you can probably pick up. Um, but I certainly- Do I need to convert my thesis? Like, do I need to convert my thesis, like modify it according to the, or I just, the, the way it is written, it should go that way. Or is it like we have to convert it into like a book book? So I'm taking the published thesis art as it is and they label it as a book. But do I really need to convert it or- um, I have no idea how to respond to that because that probably would um, be a decision between you and the publisher, but there certainly would be a little formatting required, but you certainly do not want to, you know, put all the acknowledgements for your two supervisor and, you know, all other re relevant things and um, table of contents. Um, so there would be a little bit of modification required, I guess, but other than that, um, most of it should be fine because if that, as long as it's solid research, um, I don't think um, anyone would mind um, reading, um, you know, the format that that's applicable for the research. And then you also might want to, you know, take out all the logos and images and um, standard uh, foot uh, headers for the university. Um, so that's not something that you would want to be. Uh, you you don't want it to be part of your book. Um, so apart from that, I guess it's, um, you don't have to rewrite it from the scratch. So that 
that should be fine. So, you know, it, it's not a lot of work once you actually find uh, a publisher um, to do that. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so just about to end here with the um, guidelines, uh, where I told you about the submission, um, how to actually submit in different portions of your um, research about the funding, about the uh, conflict of interest and declarations, um, and everything has to go separate. For example, tables and figures, they also have to go in a separate file and then you upload that in a relevant section um, on the editorial manager. So once you've done that, um, make sure that your formatting and referencing and figure and table and text, everything is in fine, it goes into PU review. So what happens is that it, um, for example, this specific journal, it does a double blind review. That means that um, neither the authors uh, nor the editors know who this paper actually belong from and uh, belong or you know who is it's going to uh, for the review. Um, I happen to know actually this editor uh, for this journal because I've worked with him before and I've published something with him. Um, but again, uh, as a per personal courtesy, um, that's not something um, that should be a part of the editing process and also he's an editor not a um, not someone who is going to decide if the paper gets accepted or not uh, it's going to be reviewers from the outside so that that's fine um, but just to let you know the process that there's a peer review um, and that's double blind afterwards um, you can do your re revisions if there are any comments or um, changes that editor wants you to make uh, you can do it any word processing processing software. Um, there is a brief overview of the article structure that you have to follow, the introduction, material and method section, result and discussion, conclusion and appendices. These are the sections that should be in the paper, at least if you do not have anything else, but at minimum you have to have that. And then and it also gives you brief outlines on your title, author names and affiliations, corresponding authors, um, different highlights, for example, and that specific journal, the kind of format that they put the papers out in, um, it includes a highlight, that means what um, scientific contribution your research actually makes. And then um, it follows the abstract um, and a graphical abstract if you have that, um, or just simply the keywords. Um, if there are any abbreviations, you wanna make sure that it's um, right in the start, and then you end with your acknowledgements, formatting of funding resources, if there's a scientific paper, just write about mathematical formula, then footnotes. And there's a lot of details about um, artwork, tables, references. Um, it also tells you about reference management softwares um, and the styles that your journal wants you to actually output your references in, and a lot of other things. Um, so this is a brief overview that I wanted to address today um, about how to read the guidelines for submission of your manuscript in any journal. And I also wanted to make sure that you have practically seen the interface where you uh, submit your manuscript and how to create an account there and uh, look for the submission. And I hope this has been helpful for um, you. Um, I'm gonna put out the recording for that also. Um, sorry again for the inconvenience that it's not working on uh, Facebook somehow. Um, you know, I have this live producer, uh, this new Facebook interface to put out the videos and uh, I haven't been able to um, get the hang of it, but now I'm finally will. Uh, and I'm sorry for the little noise noise here, um, but, um, I guess as long as you have the recording, the purpose has been served. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you in coming Facebook Live. If you have any questions, just uh, send it to me on WhatsApp uh, or email or any, um, any other um, channel you find me or the YouTube um, page or wherever you want. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Hope you have a nice evening.